Oh yeah, no, I'll just speak to the definition. So there are 260 million people fishing right now in the fishing industry worldwide. It's a lot of people. And 65, 70% of our seafood, well, 90% of our seafood in the U.S. comes from other countries. And about 70% of that is from developing countries. So a lot of the food we eat, a lot of the goods we use and, and they in our everyday life are, are made in a kind of unregulated space. And uh, in the last year, the federal government has closed the loophole, which now makes it illegal to import many of these goods if, if they have ties for slavery. So this year is a very special year. We didn't really talk about this before, and now it's a very important issue for commodities across the spectrum. So apparel's been um, dealing with the forced labor issue for 20 years. They just celebrated a big anniversary, and they think they're getting through it at last. Um, the mineral sector, maybe more like eight years. Now it's fishing's turn. And it's fishing's turn because the Thai industry is built on forced labor. And that continues today, although there's been radical change in Thailand for the good, but it's still the case that 90, 80-90% of the crew on boats are Burmese, and uh, at least half of them are, are un, um, registered workers, and they need 10 pieces of paper to get placed in their work, and there's a lot of exposure there for the, for the crew. So we have, in this case, a story which was written by the same journalist who did a remarkable series in Thailand not long ago, exposing a lot of, um, you know, sort of lifting the rock on the Thai industry and now making a domestic story. <laughs> I, uh, so my name is Katrina. I have been working on the task of how can business respond to, um, so businesses are responsible for their own supply chains. So you may not know this, but US law for companies to be liable anywhere in their supply chain to the seller. If you're buying something from Walmart, they're liable to how that good was produced. Now this is sort of something business owners have been operating without really understanding and now they have to all in a hurry. Well they need tools to understand because a lot of the goods are produced in, um, like I said, what you could call like a governance gap or transparency gap. Supply chains, especially in seafood, are very complicated. Lots of gaps, lots of brokers, lots of subcontracting. Uh, very complicated. So my job, I'm an independent, but I've been working with the uh, Humanity United, which is um, uh, an organization, it's actually an OMDR network uh, organization that is, its mandate is to uh, end human atrocity and one of their focal points is ending human trafficking in business. So I've been the blessed to work with them for about four years uh, to develop what we call the labor safe screen. I'll, I'll share if anybody's interested what our process is, but we work with from the biggest retailers like Whole Foods and, and um, you know Walmart uh, down to individual cases where people are trying to figure out what to do. And what happened in this case is on September 8th, um, there was a, sh a shock. And the first thing I saw happen uh, through the Hawaii Seafood Council and HLA was a decision to get the vessel owners together. Kind of like a crackheads meeting. Like who's, like, who's responsible here? And the very first thing I recommended is if there's no contract that's super clear between vessel owner and, and crew, there needs to be one now. Because <coughs> most in the, in, internationally, in fishing, most of the exposure to forced labor for crew comes from not having a contract. Like in the Thai industry, 94% Big Island study had no contract. You have to have a contract but you don't have a legal, you know, clear relationship with your employer. And here <laughs> in the US, like everywhere, employers have a duty to provide a safe workplace. They, they just, they do, in the law. It's defined in various ways. Human trafficking is a little different because it's not as easy as um, thinking that because people are from migrant countries and don't have papers, that they're enslaved. Fishing is a pretty proud f profession. It's also sometimes a highly skilled profession. And I, what we've heard so far in the fleet here, although we're certainly not done all of the listening, is that we have a pretty professional crew here and we have folks that consider it quite an advantage to work on a US boat relative to other boats. Some of them have worked on Taiwanese boats. You know, as Dr. Chris about about fishing crew and Taiwan, it's a little bit different thing. So there is a problem we have now to resolve in the fleet that goes way beyond addressing the allegations of forced labor that the article speaks to without really giving much evidence. The uh, I'll get back to that. But what what's really profoundly important right now is that the crew here understand and feel safe in their work. And one of the unfortunate fallouts hopefully short term from the article, is that a lot of crew feel like their jobs are being eliminated. And others can speak to that better than me. It's one of the things that we found that was very surprising. Um, the first thing that the Hawaii Seafood Council asked me to be involved 
with was outreach to the community to understand what supports are available. John said, we don't care right and wrong, we're not revisiting what's in this story, just find out who we can get, who, um, you know, who can speak, care about us. Uh, you know, make sure we have um, uh, uh, a way to bridge the community to the group. So I was asking uh, a number of organizations locally if they had legal language or advocacy supports. That happened like immediately in the first two weeks. And you know, variable success with finding people, um, it took us a, a few weeks to find all of the resources like the um, Safe Gateway Center and so on. Um, but what was surprising in that process is when I was talking to the people at the consoles, we just were having a really hard time uh, finding anybody who had heard of a case yet. And um, at the same time, the vessel owners had agreed to implement immediately a contract. And it was really kind of like a, the way I understood what the owners wanted was a pact among vessel owners to make sure they're all on the same page. Because some of the owners, for example, Jim thought, you know, nobody's charging recruitment fees here. We pay all the costs. How could they say they're undocumented, you know, and, and they are responsible for fees because that's not true. But they, but they didn't really know if that's true for all the boats. So the contract is a way to standardize, you know, the responsibility across the fleet. You talked about the universe of contract and the response yeah. to the Whole Foods pulling out. Yeah, well, it, it was, I don't know if it was so much response to Whole Foods pulling out, but it's just necessary. You need to have a contract. And it wasn't there, and I think, so many things are produced this way, so so many sectors are affected, but whenever you're subcontracting labor <coughs> and you have an indirect relationship with your employee, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So the first thing was shut that down. So what the contract contains is extremely simple, but it, it only contains the items which would shut out exposures to forced labor. So the payment firms, um, identifiers, uh, Accountability for payment, timing of payment, minimums on payment, the <coughs> statement that there should be no cost to the employee, um, the status, these things are, are, are there, but not much more. Because that was something that the fleet owners could be decisive about and agree to quickly, right? Uh, since the contract was implemented and the auction has agreed to oversee it, and it perhaps will be other forms of oversight in the future, which would be marvelous, transparency is good, you know? Um, Transparency is how you keep everybody accountable. Um, whatever happens with that, we have uh, also have this process under which John described with uh, hearing directly from the crew. So we we were part of some meetings initially where retailers were like, well, we send our auditor in, can we send you know, like check the box kind of auditing? Because frankly, there is no private standard which companies can use to go check if these people that are enslaved. Like imagine auditing and having people really honestly tell you as an outside auditor, oh PS, I'm I'm not being paid. The the tricky thing in fishing is a lot of men don't know if they're being paid or not if they're getting remittances home through an agency. Sometimes they're being paid, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're charged PX, sometimes they're charged PY. So now we know from the first round of uh, interviews that we need to look closer at those recruitment relationships and that will come and I think we'll see, you know, some some steps from the fleet towards uh, more standardization there as well to, to clear things up. Okay, I guess 